Welcome traders to today's session uh, where we are going to be discussing the impact of the geopolitical events on futures markets and we're also going to be looking at how we can utilize a unique trading tool uh, provided by Bookmap to better inform our trading decisions. So let's get started. Now, when it comes to crude oil, there are about 100 countries produce crude oil. In 2020, five countries produce 50% of the total world production, United States, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Canada. Now, the top three, United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, are the only ones that can produce in double digits. So in other <laughs> words, produce more than 10 million barrels a day. Uh, the United States in 2019 was close to 13 million barrels a day. Russia right now, uh, I think is around 10 million and so is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia does have some room to the upside, but we get conflicting results on this in terms of capacity, but we talk more about that later. Globally, the world consumes about 100 million barrels a day. If you can think about all the production the world does. I think of it going into one gigantic barrel. And out of that gigantic barrel of oil, the United States consumes about 19 to 20 million barrels per day. Uh, that's been typical for the last few years for this, uh, for that country, for our country here. Uh, U.S. produces about 10 to 13 million barrels per day. The world's most actively traded commodity. The NYMEX division it, by the way, that's a part of the CME group. Uh, they, the contract specs, it's a light, sweet crude oil futures contract. It's the world's most liquid form for crude oil trading. The world's largest volume futures contract trading on a futures, on a physical commodity. Contract used as an international pricing benchmark. Light, sweet crudes are preferred by, by refiners, and here's why. Because if it's light, it has low paraffin. If it's sweet, it has low sulfur. If you have heavy sour, as we were talking about from Mexico, it takes extra steps because you have a lot more paraffin and you have a lot more sulfur. So you get higher yields if you have light, sweet crude. So gasoline, diesel fuel, heating oil, your yields are higher if you have a light, sweet crude. And that's preferred by many refiners. But light, sweet crude refiners cannot necessarily refine heavy sour crudes because of extra steps that's in the process that they may not be set up for. Now let's talk about Russia the invasion of Ukraine, the economic impact. The EU market for fossil fuel supplies most of Moscow's foreign income, or at least it did. Crude oil at $70 a barrel, just for your reference, made Russia $120 billion. And we're trading above that right now. So it is a key source of revenue for them. Oil to much of Europe is being cut, as you know. Crude is instead flowing to Asia, where India has become the top buyer, followed by China. Moscow is selling crude at deep discounts at 30 to $35 a barrel. So if you're India, you got 1.4 billion people to take care of. You can buy crude oil at that discount. You have an existing relationship already. Uh, so for that to expand, not surprising. Here's an example of that expansion. India imported 12 million barrels of Russian oil in 21. This year, so far, 60 million barrels. So they've increased by five times just this year in terms of their input. So is Russia losing income stream to Europe? Yes. Is it changing? Yes. So we're seeing an example of that kind of behavior. India is a refining hub. They can send out refined products with strong margin now. Their profitability goes up. In May, some 30 Russian crude tankers went to India, unloading 430,000 barrels per day versus 60,000 barrels per day in just January and March of this year. 
So we're seeing dramatic changes there. Sri Lanka bought 99,000 ton shipment from Russian crude, and they only have one refinery to get that thing going. Turkey is another key destination for Russian crude. Uh, and there's some pipelines here we're going to take a look at. Chinese state-owned indep and independent refiners, they've also stepped up their purchases from Russia. In 2021, China was the largest single buyer of Russian oil, taking 1.6 million barrels per day on average, equally divided between pipeline and seaborne routes. Now, let's talk about nat gas. That's another major issue. So who does Russia export gas to? Well, the primary customer in Europe is Germany. Then you can see here we got Italy, Belarus, Turkey, Netherlands, Hungary. Hungary pushed back on making any changes to nat gas from Russia because it is critical for their economy. That attitude's changed a little bit. Orban's kind of rethought that, I think. But so this is where it typically flowed and you know, just a couple of years ago, that is changing. And what, what is that economic impact? What has it done? And if anybody here is in Europe, uh, one of the things you've seen is the increase in prices or maybe not seen, but felt. What we were paying $6 for, $5 for, they were paying at that point in time in this year now, over $60, 10 times more. And right now, where we are, you know, that's four times. We're, we're around $6, $7 as we're going to see. They're paying over 40 And Asia's right up there with them. So it really had a tremendous impact on the cost of not, well, a whole variety of things. And we're going to talk about what that is. One of them is right here. It's electricity. Look at these charts. You see vertical moves in each one of these for Germany, France, Italy, the cost of electricity has taken off. So many countries switched to nat gas because it burns 60% cleaner than coal. The prices were cheap and it was an economical thing to do. In the United States, we produce more electricity with natural gas than we do with coal now. And let's talk about how they move it because natural gas isn't something that's easy to move. Crude oil is far easier. You know, it is a gas. So to get it in a liquid form, you gotta squeeze it. You gotta put it under pressure to slow down the molecules and then they get it very cold and it transforms into uh, a liquid. The things that you hear so much about, I just wanna point out two things to you so that uh, when you hear about them, you'll get an idea of what they're referring to. And that's right up here. Nord Stream 2, we heard so much about that. They completed it from Russia to Germany, but it was not accepted by Germany. So that's empty. And here's Nord Stream 1, that tan line. Uh, that one was shut down on Monday for 10 days of maintenance. A lot of people are concerned. Are they gonna turn it back on? Remember though, for them to leave it off, that's income to them as well. And uh, so I don't know how aggressive they're going to be on that, but we'll see. Let's talk about another market. 16% of global corn exports. Ukraine supplies 60% of the corn to the EU. If you look at this chart of different countries, the green line is production. This is all based on percent. All right. So the green line shows percentage of world uh, production of corn. And United States is one of the larger producers, as you can see there. And if you look at it, you see China is really a biggie too, but you don't see any export. The blue line represents percentage of export. China consumes it all. They don't export it. But look at Brazil, look at Argentina, and look at our friends in Ukraine. Those four countries are critical for global supply when it comes to corn. The most common use of that corn is for animal feed. So it's for protein production is where that comes into play. Now, let's do this. Let's talk about another critical area before we finish up here. Russia is a major exporter of potash, aluminum, uh, ammonia, 
uh, urea and other soil nutrients. Disrupted shipments of key fertilizer has a global impact. Russia and Belarus account for more than 40% of the global exports of potash last year one of the three critical nutrients to boost crop yields. Russia accounted for key types of fertilizer, 22% of global exports of ammonia, 14% of urea, 14% of MAP. Brazil, the world's biggest soybean exporter, but they need imported fertilizers. And when you think about it, Russia and Belarus were the source of 50% of those shipments. So some people are saying, okay, there's problems in Europe, no problem. Farmers should just plant more. Well, do I plant more if I can't fertilize it and I can't get my return on that extra investment? That's what's being faced. Ukraine and Russia supplies 75% of the global sunflower oil. That represents 10% of all cooking oil. Indonesia, the world's largest palm oil exporter, I'll show you in a minute how these come into play, but they were planning on banning exports. Then they took the ban off. They, Indonesia accounts for half of the world's supply of palm oil, the most widely used vegetable oil. It's used for cooking and production of all kinds of products. Palm oil is competing with soybean oil prices. I'll show you that in a bit. The ban was designed to bring down domestic palm oil prices because they're trying to deal with inflation, but they've opened the door a bit and we'll see the result of that when I show you that. But crops like sunflower and corn, they're planted in the spring, but who's going to plant them in the Ukraine? If you look at the south region, of, of Ukraine and the Western region, there are some farmers out there. They're also farming around uh, big craters in their fields uh, from Russian uh, ammunition. But if you look at this, who's gonna do it? You got the draft going on, you got mined farms, the invasion itself, shortage of fuel and fertilizer. So it's, uh, and transportation challenges. And we haven't felt the impact economically of this yet, of these areas. You know, Russia, second largest supplier of platinum. platinum. Uh, Ukraine supplies more than 90% of a semiconductor grade neon gas used in lasers in the US semiconductor chip manufacturing. We think we had a problem before with semiconductor chips and not being able to get cars produced and other items. Well, we haven't had totally felt this either. Russia supplies 35% of the palladium also for chips. Large impact on the European car manufacturing, Volkswagen, BMW, closed assembly lines in Germany because there's a shortage of wiring harnesses, harnesses that are manufactured in Ukraine. Tire manufacturer Michelin also announced that it's going to close European uh, plants because of the logistics of this invasion. Last thing I want to show you here, look at, look at the the, this breakdown of items that come into play here. And you look at palladium and platinum, those are used to produce uh, catalytic converters. Uh, so where's that gonna be coming from? We can start feeling the pinch in that regard. And we've talked about these other areas, but I wanna point that out that I think the impact, economic impact as we get through harvest as we still have to deal with these transportation logistics, we're gonna see continuing impacting the market. And let's do this. Let's, let's look, well, let's do, let's finish this, I guess. I wanna tell you something about where does Russia fit in? It's 11th, the largest economy in the world. It's 1.7% of the global economy. Its GDP is around 1.5 trillion, slightly smaller than the state of Texas. Ukraine's economy is about the size of Nevada's economy and it's 33rd in the United States. Prior to the invasion of Ukraine, total value of the Russian stock market, which was really coming back, $251 billion. And that's about equal to the market cap of PepsiCo. In 2020, 36.5 of all Russian imports and 37.9 of exports were with the EU. So it's not just crude oil and that gas. Bruce, I'm gonna turn this over to you to have you share with us the, the 
interesting things that's going on with book math. All right. Well, first off, uh, you know, for a lot of traders, when uh, they look at book map here, uh, they're very confused. Uh, and there's a lot of information on the chart here. Uh, it makes sense. Uh, I understand that, uh, that uh, uh, it looks very uh, uh, complex. It's actually not complex. It's quite the opposite. And I'm just going to give a quick overview so uh, everybody uh, understands what they're looking at here. This is going to show you the other side of the trade. Who's on the other side? It's from the order book. So if we look at the current market right here, everything to the right of the vertical white line here uh, is current best bid and offer, last traded volume, our price ladder, and the COB column stands for current order book. So what you're looking at here uh, is the an amount of contracts. These are limit sell orders above the market and limit buy orders down below. You have the numerical values in a histogram in here. If we zoom in a little bit, I'll show you. Uh, and so you can see the liquidity. This, this is the, the auction here right now. Uh, and we can see that they're always adding and pulling liquidity uh, from the market. And this is where you find your buyers and sellers. All we're doing in Bookmap is taking that liquidity and transforming it graphically. So areas of high liquidity, 62 contracts or 96 down here, is this uh, color. It's uh, this red orange. You can see the heat map up here, uh, the scale of the heat map. Red and orange is very high liquidity, then yellow, and then white, and then blue, and then black is the least amount. So all we're doing is taking it and plotting it onto the chart, but we record it. And we plot it onto the chart historically. So what looks to be really complex with all these different colors and lines is very, very simple. It is the adding and pulling of liquidity, and that's all it is. So if we zoom out and look at the higher uh, time frame picture here, uh, I've got data back to about 6 a.m. Uh, East Coast time. Uh, we can take a look at this context. So here's the market as it's coming down toward this area of high liquidity at 05. Uh, and uh, it traded into it right here. You can see the transactions taking place right into it. And then it traded through it in a big way. Okay, pretty, pretty catastrophic break there. Uh, and it continued on down and tested parity here. Okay, so interesting move into that. And we know, as you can see in the heat map here, see how it's getting kind of red in here? And see how the, that they're, they're kind of bidding in front of this area? This is context. This is showing that, yeah, they're eager buyers in front of that area. They're starting to front run. Uh, and we can understand that behavior. You can also see that buyers started to add in a little bit lower here. They're probably looking for a price to test through it, get filled at a really great price, and then have it test back and maybe through uh, the dollar uh, value here. So uh, anyway, the um, uh, that's uh, what what was what unfolded here uh, in the market. We, we can see uh, precisely the behavior here. These guys meant to trade, uh, and they're still here in the current market. Uh, these guys up here at uh, O2, uh, well, they started to come in not too long ago. As the market is coming down, they started to show interest uh, at a higher level here. This is the context. This is where the buyers want to deal. And now we'll see if they, they actually deal when price comes down, like here, and trades into it. And this is the, what we want to understand. And this is how you can now look into and see what's going on within the candlesticks. In fact, we can dim the heat map a little bit here, uh, and we can look uh, uh, a little bit more uh, closely uh, at the candlesticks and the, uh, uh, the volume and the, and the liquidity. So uh, here's our, our move to the downside, and as, as Dan pointed out, the buying pressure. Okay, so uh, it, uh, this candle closed uh, uh, with, uh, uh, to the downside here, but we found some buyers. Uh, and then off of this low here, well, we start to find more buyers. Uh, and then we break through. Now this level is not really seen too much in the candles. This is an hour uh, candlestick chart, uh, but we can see that uh, uh, this hour here closed at, the, at this kind of uh, swing uh, and kind of equal low from the previous hour and then the, then the breakthrough. Okay? Now look at the breakout and uh, now it's returning precisely to the area where it broke out from. So some pretty interesting stuff here. Now in your candlestick, 
uh, this is looking pretty good to continue lower. Why? Because look at the, and this is not a trade recommendation, we're just reading the order flow. Uh, here's why. Well, look at the sellers come in uh, and uh, we just broke below the swing here. Now we wanna see that selling pressure continue. So let's zoom in here a little bit closer uh, and let's read the order flow. Uh, let's, let's turn the heat map uh, back up a bit. Uh, and uh, this is good. We see that there's more sellers now at a lower level. Okay. Uh, we're, uh, did we find the sellers down here? Not, not really. Nice selling in here. And it's starting to kind of wane now. Well, maybe we'll get a, a retest back up here. Uh, back up into uh, uh, this little kind of uh, a zone or area right here uh, at, at 475, maybe back up to uh, 525. Okay, so now look at the liquidity just coming into the market right now. Interesting, interesting move there or interesting phenomena. Uh, a lot of people uh, just jumping in um, and uh, uh, interest in uh, uh, dealing here. So uh, now uh, let's let's take a look at that. So we have kind of equal buyers and sellers on either side here. So it's kind of convoluting the picture a little bit here. Uh, we want to read now the context though of this liquidity that came in. So how did the market react to it? Do we find buyers or sellers here? And we haven't really found much yet. Now we're starting to find a little bit of buy or selling here. Okay, all right, sellers, then let's see if you can drop it down to 03 here uh, or maybe 250 or, or 200 down here. Okay. So we're just uh, looking at the, what's inside this candle and this big move to the downside here uh, on the hourly uh, candlestick chart and below uh, the swing here. We need to see sellers below the swing for continuation and to move away from these previous areas in here. And that's what we're reading in here and trying to read. Okay. If we don't get that, we're looking for the retest back here to this liquidity. So you can really start to uh, uh, see what's inside uh, some of the candlesticks and then start to target some of these areas as well. Just a quick question from Howard, uh, looking for some clarification with respect to what the red and blue lines below mean. I think okay. you explained at the start. Um, but yeah, just... well, this, this, isn't, it, this isn't part of, of Bookmap. This is an add-on. Uh, I'm showing it just because like um, uh, it is... Uh, a pretty, pretty powerful and insightful um, uh, thing that uh, uh, the CME offers uh, uh, market by order data. Okay, this is something unique. They've had it for about, I think over five years now, uh, uh, but no one's really um, taken too much advantage of it in, 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 until the last uh, few years. Uh, it, it's showing the positioning queue. Uh, you can look it up on the CME website and it will show you precisely like, like right now, if we look at uh, this uh, S&P E-mini uh, and we look in here uh, with the current order book, well, these are the number of contracts here, okay, but we don't know how many orders are in here. So like actually down here, we actually do. Uh, and this is pretty insightful too. Uh, let me show you this. These, these three areas of high liquidity here, well, this little white line here uh, is, is indicating uh, that uh, one, uh, larger player is holding um, about, you know, between a third and half of the liquidity at this price level. And it's most likely the same player because look, he's got it on three different levels here. This price level at 46 and a quarter, 46 and 45 and three quarters. So the, the white line is equal, likely the same player. Uh, so, uh, uh, that's basically what the MBO was, uh, or the way that the CME advertises it. However, we're able to extrapolate from that data and the way that the orders come in, we can start to read where uh, people are getting stopped out, uh, as well as where there's hidden orders, uh, not in the, in the order book. Uh, they're, uh, uh, they're icebergs. Uh, and that's the whole concept of the iceberg is a larger player doesn't want to show his hand like this guy right here. Uh, so uh, doesn't want to scare price away. Uh, so he wants to get filled without showing uh, how much liquidity he has. Uh, so that's, that's what the uh, sub chart is showing here. We also have it on chart, but I, I turned it off. Okay, another question. Uh, will Bookmark show resting stop losses for the E-mini futures? I think you covered that before with the icebergs and that's an additional add-on, is it? 
Um, well, yeah, not we don't know where stops are resting, um, but we know when they transact. Uh, but uh, yeah, in fact, let me turn on the uh, uh, the on chart uh, indicator here uh, for stops in the icebergs, uh, and uh, you can take a look at uh, some of the details in here. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by it, uh, to be honest, and uh, it, it never gets uh, tiresome. So here was a stop run of 134 contracts up here. Well, this is what it looks like. And this is what happens uh, uh, in the market. And we're just, th this is the beauty of what I think Bookmap is displaying, is it's simply displaying what unfolded. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't, uh, it's giving you the, the truth of what's behind uh, some of these moves. So this is aggressor behavior in here, uh, lifting the offer, okay? And, uh, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, uh, microseconds in here. So, um, you know, this, this move here, it looks like it might be, uh, uh, you know, something uh, lost data or, or something. It is not. It is uh, uh, basically a one event, an atomic event that took place and unfolded. And then Best did an offer update after that. So you have a kind of a chain of events that happen when you get down into these subsecond levels. So here, uh, buyer came in, it could have, they could have been squeezed out. Uh, we don't know, uh, but um, we know that there was a lot of buying in here. Along the way in this big move to the upside here, stops are triggered. But this one player uh, has not, his order has not gotten filled yet. His order is basically filled up here. And this red line in here is showing when stops are now starting to transact. Okay, so along the way, as this one event unfolded, stops are triggered, and we don't know where exactly, uh, but we know when they're transacting. And when you get slipped and your, your stop gets slipped, this is what this is exactly what was happening. So you can see precisely uh, where the stops start to transact, and they actually lift the market uh, a tick or two in here as well, one tick. Bruce, uh, we've got some interest in taking a look at, I, I don't know if you've got yesterday's data um, on the heat map for the drop that we saw in the ES or the NQ. I do, I, here it is. I mean, uh, and this is very typical. Uh, another thing, like uh, just the kind of insights that you can, you can ascertain here uh, from order flow, like, you know, as, as this is moving lower, these clusters, of selling at lower lows into high liquidity. And then you can see how the market kind of bounces out of those areas, retests some of these areas. And look on the other side here. Where's the liquidity? There's not a whole lot. This is very typical in a downtrend. Uh, you'll see this uh, all the time. It's more clusters at the lower lows uh, and very little buying uh, uh, at these uh, uh, swings here that are uh, is basically exhausting out. It's just not finding buyers. Uh, that's when you can start to look at your candles uh, and your wicks, uh, et cetera, uh, starting to understand that, uh, uh, wow, okay, well, we're not getting a whole lot. If we get some sellers below this area here, you know, look for a break. Uh, and look, look again, we're retested here, right to where it broke from. Right? So uh, I, there's a lot of things that you can kind of uh, piece together uh, that, uh, you know, trap traders uh, comes back here and like, oh boy, yeah, I'll sell, uh, no, no problem. Uh, whatever the case may be, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's here uh, in the order flow. You really can't escape it. Does Bookmark offer the facility for uh, traders to get that data? To yes. It does, excellent. Yes, yeah, we, you, you can uh, uh, subscribe to uh, uh, some data feeds for, uh, for stocks, uh, as well as, um, I think up to 21 different cryptocurrency exchanges that we connect to. Just go to bookmap.com and, and connectivity section. You'll you'll see uh, uh, there are many different exchanges that we connect to. A bit different there. The data is is free. They, they're ex you're connecting directly to the exchange, uh, not a data provider or ECN. Uh, but uh, uh, with the, the futures market here, for example, I'm connected to Rhythmic right now. You can connect to CQG uh, and uh, a host of others uh, as well. So we connect to uh, many for futures as well. Let's take a look at uh, what happened to our uh, uh, euro dollar here. So it accepted lower uh, and uh, we, we, we kind of left off seeing these buyers come in. 
Uh, and they were able to kind of, uh, as you can see here, kind of lift the market from this consolidation period here and the buying here that we saw come in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we haven't come back there yet. Uh, so it all, all it did was it was test up and we were kind of looking for that test up in this liquidity up here, uh, this 450 to 470 area here, uh, which has already already tested. Now a question is with kind of uh, reassess the, the uh, value here of this instrument. Once again, we've tested up here. Uh, are we finding more buyers? Well, then where's the next area? Well, high liquidity and also market structure, maybe up here at uh, 560, you know, something like that. And Bruce, uh, Ingo asks, could you please do a brief intro into the order column? Okay, so this one, the current order book? Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, this is basically your dome. Uh, we actually have a, another um, uh, add-on product that uh, is actually part of, of one of the subscriptions, the Bookmap Global Plus subscription. Uh, and uh, we have a, 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 a DOM that you can uh, uh, access your very professional uh, level DOM here. Uh, so uh, I, I can show you that as well. It's up to you. Uh, you know, you can, you can uh, uh, create a, 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 a configuration here in the columns or you can access uh, this product here, uh, and uh, uh, you know trade right from the uh, from the DOM if you if you uh, prefer that. So this is uh, obviously it's a separate window here, uh, so you can we have the flexibility uh, to take a look at that as well. How you can uh, the visualize spoofing? You know the uh, euro dollar is actually a pretty interesting one because this is so uh, heavily kind of uh, hedged. Uh, you can see the larger players in here. Uh, at each price level. And, you know, it, you can kind of start to understand that, well, this is likely some of the same players in here, the moment that they pull out of these three different price levels, you know, they're, they're kind of adding and pulling in here. And we can start to also, um, when we zoom in, uh, you can start to, let's find a better example, um, start to, to piece together, like, uh, you know, them pulling from, uh, some players pulling from one side and adding to the other, uh, Etc. Like right in here, uh, this liquidity was pulled because it went from first off from uh, high liquidity, uh, and uh, we can get the number here, um, uh, 49 contracts, down to 40, down to this color here, uh, which is uh, 35. Well, they kind of added here on the other side uh, and uh, uh, pulled from here and potentially added over here. Uh, that went from uh, 21. 26 to 35. And you'll see this uh, behavior um, again and again and again, uh, like in these areas in here, maybe adding here, pulling down here, uh, et cetera. So you can really start to look at the nuances of the activity of the intention of traders. Do they want to trade at these levels or not? Uh, here, you can see that uh, uh, they wanted to trade. They, they provided that liquidity, and here, here are the transactions taking place right into that liquidity. So these guys got what they wanted. They wanted to be buyers here, and they, they bought. Sellers traded into them, and the transaction took place. This is, this is a buy sweep. Uh, we, have a, we, have, we do have a, a sweeps uh, indicator that will also show these areas on the chart, uh, and uh, we also have an absorption indicator as well. Uh, those are all part of the Global Plus uh, subscription package. Uh, all these kind of add-on indicators. Uh, do uh, Bookmap provide uh, uh, training videos for for the for the service? Oh yeah, we we have um, um, hundreds of, of videos basically, but uh, 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 you know some of the uh, are, are more kind of onboarding of of, of kind of uh, going through uh, you know some of these elements, how, how to read them. Uh, and then all the different features and components. Uh, and uh, we also have daily webinars uh, that go through uh, reading the uh, live market uh, order flow. It was great to be here with everyone today. I hope you've gotten a few ideas from Discuss that may give you some insights. And Thanks. in the meantime, I wish everyone much success with their trading. No, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, no, a pleasure. Uh, and uh, I too look forward to crossing paths again in the future.